All right, our next speaker is Amjad Massad from Replit. Uh, come on up here. We're gonna start off with, uh, what was Paul Graham's quote about Replit? Which one? Is that a few? The, uh, you, you know the one. Yeah, he was like, uh, Replit is the next Microsoft. So Paul Which, Graham, who started Y Combinator, knows you guys pretty well, thinks that you guys are the next Microsoft. Let's talk about why, and, and not so much from his perspective, but you've been working on this for a while. You have not focused on making money. You have not focused on all the bullshit. You basically have just been building a product that really solves a problem for customers. Where does that kind of discipline and focus come from? By the way, just before we get started, I was so engrossed by the uh, talk with Howard. He, I don't know if people realize, but he dropped some really serious uh, alpha. <laughs> uh, like a lot of what he talked about, I, I sort of had to learn the hard way. Yeah. You know, for example, the one-on-ones thing, you know, I, um, I used to like get, get so drained uh, just doing these therapy sessions with everyone. And it was like, like, is this why you started a company to be a therapist? I was like, no, I'm just going to pay for coaches for all of you. Mm -hmm. And he can just go talk to coaches. But uh, a lot of his, uh, a lot of what he said is like really deep wisdom that it took me a long time to, I was basically like vigorously nodding my head over there, uh, which is really awesome. Uh, so I hope I can sort of match that. But um, yeah, so uh, I think, you know, started uh, working on Replit um, or the idea that became Replit like back in college. Uh, so I was doing computer science uh, at, uh, at university back in Amman, Jordan, where I'm from. That was 2008, nine. Um, and, you know, I, I thought that um, I could open a browser window and start coding in the same way that I could open a browser window, go to my email, go to Google Docs. Turns out nobody has built that. I was like, what? What? This is crazy. Uh, it, it's sort of like it's sort of like finding a hundred dollars. On the, on the floor of Grand Central Station, it's like, it's impossible. Like, why is this idea nobody has worked on? Pretty quickly, I found out it's pretty fucking hard. That's why you know, nobody's done that. Uh, so it, that started kind of my obsession with this idea of like, um, w why hasn't this been done before? And also, wh what does it mean for the world of actually uh, software creation becomes as accessible as creating a document, as posting a picture, as all of this stuff. And kind of the more I thought about it, uh, the, the more the implications felt that it was gonna be really big. Like mm -hmm. uh, if, if we, like on the order of the, of the creation of the printing press, mm -hmm. like the printing press uh, made it such that um, uh, uh, sort of reading and writing uh, became such a important things, thing civilizationally um, and, you know, all the democratic, scientific, all the revolutions we've saw since, since the Gutenberg uh, press in the, you know, 1500s or something like that, were the result of that, right? Like, we wouldn't be where we are as a civilization if um, we wouldn't have this concept of, you know, anyone can write and, and you can broadcast, anyone can read it. Obviously, the internet brought it to the next step. Well, I, I would take it a step even further, right? Shopify has this um, mantra of like arm the rebels and they're yeah. talking about arming e-commerce uh, kind of smaller businesses that want to go sell things on the internet compared to the Goliath of unsaid Amazon. And you all though almost feel like you are arming the rebels of the next generation that basically you're saying, look, learn to code and then we will give you this sandbox to go build anything that you possibly can yeah. and like go take over the world. Right. What are you seeing in terms of that first customers that come in, because I, I think part of what I'm so impressed by your business is the long-term thinking it takes to not just go and say, hey, I want you know the best coders in the world to be able to go onto this web page and be able to code. You literally start with like, well, if we need enough users, we should teach them how to code. Yes. And then you're so far upstream that you can capture a lot of the value yeah. a la Microsoft. Which actually gonna be bigger than Microsoft. Uh, if we if we did it right, right, because Microsoft uh, ultimately relied on sort of people already knowing how to build things and how mm -hmm. to code. And what Howard said about kind of not letting your VCs dictate your growth rate, 
that's something that really benefited us, uh, us a lot because, um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that you built a good product. Okay, now you go sell it to companies, uh, and you figure out what the companies want, and you build for that. But actually, when you go to enterprises and you ask them what they want, they want the past. They don't want the future. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of, it's a premature optimization that locks you into the ways of the past and doesn't really lo let you innovate. Whereas what we wanted to do is actually make the active software creation radically different, radically more accessible, more fun, more interesting, more exciting, faster. And to do that, we had to go arm the rebels, right? We had to go after the entrepreneurs, the hobbyists, the misfits, the weirdos, the students, the kids, the, everyone that wasn't really underserved by the enterprise of operational market. Um, and, um, and so, uh, you know, the, uh, um, le learning is just a means to an end, uh, learning, you know, it could be fun to just learn something for fun, but people learn to code in order to create something and people want to create all sorts of things with code, you know, from art to science, but also companies. And we've been so focused on this idea of enabling entrepreneurs, um, and initially it started on a small scale, like, you know, someone who built like a, uh, like an app or something like that. And that would go viral. Maybe they, they make a few dollars off, off of it or game. But, uh, just, uh, yesterday someone, um, uh, sent me a tweet, um, built this company called spellbook.ai. They just raised $11 million. And he's like, I couldn't have done it without Replit. It allowed us to move on a week by week basis create new MVPs and new prototypes and get it in front of customers. And he's like, I wouldn't be here without, without the, the speed that this, this gave me. So let's talk about artificial intelligence. Um, it is this, I'll call it a new technology, even though it's not really new. Um, it seems to have caught the world uh, by surprise in some degree, but also people very quickly are wrapping their heads around, this is gonna to touch every industry. You all are heavily involved, both I think in terms of uh, many of your users are using this new technology. Uh, you all are doing everything from hackathons to you know incorporating the technology into your product. Um, and then you personally are very interested and involved in terms of how this is gonna get regulated and, and kind of uh, some of the pros and cons of current approaches. Talk just about when you see something that is so potentially fundamentally shifting, how do you even wrap your head around what is the technology and like what the implications are and how you can adapt your business to it? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is to really understand what the, what the technology does um, from as close to an ax axiomatic understanding of the technology as possible, right? So for us, uh, we were focused on the active software creation uh, so what are the things that actually make, like, so in the ideal scenario, you have an idea and you turn that idea into a product or a piece of software instantaneously, right? That's, you want a zero friction, uh, you know, zero milliseconds between idea to software, right? So, okay, what are the steps that actually make it, make it so that it's not zero milliseconds, like it's actually hour, two, week, month, whatever it is. Um, and there's all these complexities that has to do with software, with coding, things like that. And so, okay, let's, let's take the active, actually coding the MVP or the prototype. A lot of that is just boilerplate and it's just uh, like keystrokes to just uh, help the computer understand what's in your mind. And a lot of that could be automated. And we did a lot of classical automation of these things. Like it's, uh, you know, just running scripts and, um, and, and kind of pre-setting up things and configuring a lot of what makes Replit special. But I always thought that the next level is gonna be about generating code. And we looked at it when I started the company around 2016, 17, and there were some interesting experiments there, actually using very primitive language models, but uh, it wasn't just there. Look at it again in 2018, 19. It was kind of GPT-1, 2. It's like, oh, that's an interesting thing. But like, hey, that generates like a lot of crappy code and syntax doesn't compile or whatever. And then GPT-3 happened. I was like, okay, it's now here. And we went kind of all in in, in 2020, 21, released our first generative AI product. Uh, and 22 released Ghostwriter, our flagship kind of code generation product. D describe a little bit about what Ghostwriter does. Uh, Ghostwriter has a lot of different modalities. And like the most simple way is like as you're coding, it actually predicting 
what you're going to code next and just doing it for you. So it'll present a suggestion similar to, you know, Copilot or Gmail kind of autocomplete kind of background suggestion. If you like it, you just hit tab. If you don't like it, you just keep coding. That's like a, the main modality people use it with. The other thing is if you actually want to stop and construct a prompt uh, to generate like a function or a class or an entire file, you can do right click generate code and actually give it a natural language prompt. And this goes to the largest model that we have or on offering so that we can generate an entire file. So this is this has to be accurate. The error rate needs to be really low here. If you want to talk about any of these things, if you want to talk to the AI about what it just generated, if you want to ask questions about any code, if you want to plan a larger refactor or change, we have a chat modality as well, where you can like go and have a, um, have a multi-turn conversation with the AI. So as you're using these technologies, what's interesting to me is the people who use the technology is very different. If somebody goes in and uses ChatGPT and it's, you know, uh, your mother, your friend, uh, who maybe isn't as technical, doesn't have kind of the hacker mentality, they may ask it somewhat primitive questions. Yeah. When you put these tools in the hands of people who have that hacker mentality and have the skill set to leverage them, um, they can move incredibly quickly yes. and they can really stretch the limitations of what these technologies do. Can you tell us one or two you know, stories of things you're seeing people do that even you who are in this every single day and you know, have a good sense of the technology, you're like, I cannot believe that people are building this stuff? So, so I, I kind of knew that this made coding easier. What I was surprised by is like one day, this guy built a 250K ARR, single guy on Replit, business, right, uh, in, in a few months. Um, and I started talking to him, just trying to understand how he, he's using the product. And he asked me a question, uh, and I'd like to provide some support to our customers as well. So he asked me a question, it was like, how do I do, how do I lock a file, make sure I'm not editing it while I'm changing another file? He was describing Git, he was describing version control. So here's a guy who built a quarter million dollars, probably gonna go into one million ARR, without knowing Git. You know, and the conventional wisdom is that, oh, you need to learn all this, you go to college and you go through, you know, you go through the motions, you learn Git and all of that, and you start a project, get in it, whatever. All this bullshit doesn't matter. What matter is actually being able to create a product. And I asked him like, how are you able to do it? And he's like, yeah, just the AI. And you know, I'll go back and forth with the AI. Um, you know, I'll produce an error. Uh, when the error happens, I'll either use Ghostwriter or paste it in ChatGPT if I wanted like a longer conversation. And he uses all the AI tools. He uses Bard and ChatGPT and Replica Ghostwriter and everything. Um, and it, it's just this iterative thing between that person, the environment, and the AI that actually produces the code at the end. And this, this is a non-coder that built a, co a startup with code. Um, and I didn't think that was possible. Um, is that really that different? Like one of the jokes I think if you go to hang out with developers is like, it's all just Googling, right? <laughs> You're laughing because that is the joke, right? Um, and, and so like to some degree, are we just now outsourcing the Googling to the AI and it's yeah. coming back with the code or is there something different that's happening? Yeah, I, 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 think, that's, um, I think that's part of it. I think what's different is that Google doesn't talk back to you. Mm -hmm. The AI actually can ask you clarify, uh, clarifying questions, can provide feedback. It's a lot more personalized. So it's like Google taking to its ultimate conclusion. The other thing that I found interesting in how a lot of these entrepreneurs are building businesses is, uh, you know, thinking about generative AI as a suite of tools that allow you to build fundamentally new experiences. We have another startup founder, uh, Priya, who. Um, built this very interesting app that basically takes a document and creates a multimedia presentation from that document. Uh, and it is a pipeline of a lot of different LLMs and a lot of different generative tools, such as audio, video. And it, it's kind of obvious, like you want to put these things together, but the, the extent to which people are pipelining these tools to generate an end creative product um, is, is really surprising and makes me really excited because we're, we're getting to a point where the, the way to think about these AIs is more like employees, is more like extensions of yourself. It's more like, you know, a team members that have different specialties that you can 
kind of bring in depending on the task you want to do. And, and that's really how the people who embrace these tools the most use them as. Mm -hmm. They kind of view them as extension of their teams or themselves. You all, I think more so than any company I've seen, uh, seem to hire your users or hire your customers. And this seems like a great hack to really get high quality people who believe in the mission. Yeah. Talk a little bit as to like what that process looks like and do you think other companies should be doing this more often? It, it, the process is that um, it, it's just so natural. It's, it's just so organic. Like we uh, sometimes, like some users force themselves into the company in a way. <laughs> Where uh, he, he sort of like they apply, they send an email to our jobs. They, they apply in whatever uh, you know portal we use for jobs. They send emails to individual uh, employees. They go to contribute to to our to our open source repos. They'll do everything to be useful, and and suddenly we just see them as as part of our team. I'm like, okay, I guess we're gonna let this 15 year old kid like you know join our team. And, you know, a lot of these kids stay for a long time. I mean, um, we've had we've had people join when they're 18. Uh, and, um, and actually, recently, someone left, they're like 25. I was like, oh, I kind of want to see other things in the world. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, OK, you know, you've, uh, you've you've earned your keep in a way. And they're rich as, as well. Right. <laughs> They've made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, they got stock options at Replit like really, really early on. Um, and, uh, and it's awesome, like seeing all these hackers and, and these people that wouldn't otherwise be getting jobs, like get jobs at Replit. And, and a lot of them are younger, right? Yeah. That you guys are specifically seeing because of kind of the hacker culture and, and the product itself and you're teaching people to code, but can it be replicated in other businesses? Um, I think so. So we, we've, had, we've had instances where <laughs> Where pe look, actually, I would say that everyone who, almost everyone who joins Replit has used the product and has loved the product and loved the mission and the vision. Um, and so there's like a, some selection effect that you can apply onto a lot of other companies. So I think the way traditionally recruiting works is you hire a recruiting team or recruiting agency and they go out into the world and they cold email a bunch of people. And you kind of need to do that at least early on. But you know, you have a lot of low context people coming in and you have to sell them on the vision. They have to actually believe it. And, and you know, some seasoned executives will get themselves to believe anything, right? To, you know, they just want to be team players. But it's not as strong as when you actually get people who believe. And I think you could do that by actually just interacting with your customers all the time, uh, with your partners, uh, and you're going to be building these relationships, again, that will make it very organic to just hire from. So as you guys are building, there's a philosophy along with the actual product itself. Uh, there's been a rise of EAC. Um, and it's this idea of just like everything needs to accelerate rather than have people tell us to slow down or to overregulate or to um, stop using energy. And, you know, we can go down the line of all kind of the stupid arguments that are being made in the world. How important is it for the philosophy to be aligned with the business? And like, how do you kind of take that and incorporate it into the company culture? Because I think that really, if I talk to anyone at Replit, like there's a, it's like, of course you work at Replit. And, and that seems like a really important part of the success of the business. This episode is brought to you by Aradine. They are a brand new startup led by a number of Silicon Valley legends who just raised $81 million to build the future of internet infrastructure. You're probably wondering what that means. So let me explain. There are numerous new disruptive technologies that are being adopted simultaneously, from blockchain to artificial intelligence to zero-knowledge technologies. In order to ensure that these technologies thrive in this new world, we need new infrastructure, and that is where Aradine comes in. They just launched their first product line called Terraflux, which is a Bitcoin miner powered by the world's first 4 nanometer silicon chip technology. These air-cooled, single-phase and dual-phase immersion cooling miners have unrivaled speed and efficiency. They have superior uptime, and they leverage a brand new innovation called Energy Tune that allows miners to dynamically adjust the energy consumption and Bitcoin hash rate based on demand response needs of the electrical grids. 
Aradyne is an ambitious company working on hard problems. I'm really impressed with them. And if you want to check out more, you can go to Auradine.com. That's A-U-R-A-D-I-N-E.com. Go check them out at Auradine.com today. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think there's like a radical streak at Replit in, in what we're doing, which is um, how do you take uh, this sort of arcane art of software creation that's been sort of created a lot of wealth, typically for a small population of people, typically in Silicon Valley, and actually make that so that anyone in the world can participate in it. And my story, where I came from, and being able to come here and become a founder uh, and build this company that has a big impact, I think that story could be done a hundred, a thousand, a million times. And a lot of the reason it hasn't been done is because of artificial constraints, whether it's constraints on the tools and how accessible they are. And a lot of times it's regulations, it's uh, certain ways of doing things that perhaps not so explicitly, but sometimes implicitly is about um, trying to centralize power. Uh, AI is where we see that happening right in front of our eyes in a very accelerated manner. Um, where there's like a clear power grab by incumbents, you know, going to DC, telling them, um, hey, I'm building something very dangerous. You should create a moat around it so that I'm the only one building it. Well, Pretty why, why would they say that? <laughs> I mean, it's kind I mean, of let's comical. Just get it, let's just get into it. It's like, kind of comical. Like if, if I was, if, if I was like, um, if I'm like uh, making a sci-fi about like an evil executive that wants to uh, rec- to do records of capture, it, 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 yeah, I wouldn't go as absurd as what we're seeing now <laughs> with the CEOs going in front of Congress and literally saying saying that. It's, so, so before we get to so the, naked, yeah, before we get to the critiques of what they're doing, let's maybe put ourselves. And, and for those that don't know, maybe some context is helpful. So. Uh, AI is huge. Uh, there's a number of companies, probably three, four, or five of them, um, who have been building various components or technologies around AI. And rather than take the normal stance that most technology companies have done for ever, and been like, "Hey, government, you stay over there. We'll stay over here, and like, you know, leave us alone. We'll leave you alone." These people are basically going and knocking on the door in Washington, and they're saying. Regulate me, bro. <laughs> Regulate me, daddy. Yeah, which like, <laughs> if you kind of think about it, like what, why would you do that? And so like, what is their thought process or, or what is the advantage? What's the incentive for them to go do this? I, I, it's, it's pretty obvious. Like I, I kind of like, um, look, there are true believers that believe that AI is actually gonna kill everyone. Uh, it's like a fringe, Theory started in like Berkeley. They wrote this blog post, a uh, blog um, site called Less Wrong. You can go read it. It's pretty insane. Um, it's, and they, they misnamed it. It should have just been wrong. <laughs> yeah, just wrong. Uh, just keep it simple. Um, but but and, and I think those those guys are true believers. I actually have more respect for them than uh, you know. They you know a lot of the a lot of the people um, that are actually asking for regulation are using the same arguments. Um, and Mark Andreessen um, actually wrote this blog post about AI recently, and um, he kind of drew parallels to the period of um, uh, yeah, what's the period where al- they banned alcohol? Uh, prohibition. Yeah, the prohibition. And he he said that, that during the prohibition there was actually like true believers, and there were actually profiteers. And so what we're seeing a lot of the you know executives that are asking for regulation are profiteering from the natural fear that people have from AI and the very potent message that some of those true believers have actually put together over many, many, many years. Um, and the immediate, the immediate need uh, to create a mode is because open source is actually catching up at a rate that never happened before. You know, typically, um, sort of, uh, typically there's a lead time between software and open source competitors. Uh, In AI, we've actually, that that lead time has been shrinking. Uh, And and thanks to people like Zuck, who's emerged as a hero uh, in the situation with Llama and Llama Code and Llama 2, um, 
you know, it, the lead time is only a year or so, or a year and a half. Like, you know, I think GPT-4 level uh, open source AI is probably Llama 3, which I know they're training right now as we speak. So uh, th th there's a th there's a th impeding threat that would eat into the bottom line of a lot of the the AI oglipoly right now. So, um, and, and is this compounded by, um, I saw a report recently that ChatGPT traffic is down for three months in a row. Do you feel like um, there's kind of these short-term pressures of, obviously there's more of these products on the market. Some of them are open source, some of them are just closed source competitors. And so people kind of got through the threshold, hey, we're the market leader at the moment and they want to close the door behind them. And that's really what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Like, do you have another explanation for it? Like, I can't, I can't think of any. Like, even if I want to be extremely charitable, like, do you actually believe that those CEOs are actually like uh, think they can kill everyone in the world? Uh, like, existential risk. They actually like, if they thought that, why are you working on it? <laughs> you know, um, and and so I just can't. I, I, like, when I really try hard to kind of think. Uh, for an explanation that is actually um, as charitable as possible. Like the best I can come up with, if you're actually worried about, um, say, uh, like effective AI on fraud, effective AI on critical infrastructure, you would regulate the applications of these, right? So for example, uh, the US government can say, we can't apply AI to utility companies managing electricity or water or whatever. That, that would be a reasonable thing to, to say, or you have to kind of meet a certain threshold for applications and X, Y, and Z. But what they're asking, the policy proposal that OpenAI, Anthropic, and others have put forward is that AI that has used X amount of flops of compute should be banned uh, or, or should be banned from the open. And only a small group of people should be able to train that. And again, that's like a that's like a pretty clear. They're not even trying sort of like pull the ladder type mm -hmm. of approach. And look, I, I mean, a lot of those people I respect and are my friends. I've, we're, we've worked with them for a long time. But my uh, my ultimate goal and the reason I'm working at Replit and I've done a lot of open source. I was part of the React JS core team, React Native, and you know most of my career has been done in open source. And I think open source is one of the best tools for um, freedom and software self-determination and uh, opportunities for people to build businesses all over the world. Uh, it just decentralizes the opportunity in software in the same way that, that Replit as well does. Um, and, um, and AI is the future of software. It's literally just software, right? Um, and it, if, if the future of software is bottlenecked by these regulations, then they get, that's going to be really bad for the world. We're, we're basically cutting off a potential much better future. You know, the other day I was um, I was looking. There was uh, this research uh, that came out after like a uh, multiple years of study showing that metformin um, uh, during when you have symptoms of COVID, if you take metformin, it reduces your um, your long COVID uh, incidence by forty percent. The, the thing that generated the hypothesis for this is an AI. So in, in April 2020, uh, a, a group of scientists at, at some university uh, used computer simulations and actually natural language processing um, to understand how COVID kind of works and what potential interventions. And they hypothesized at the time that metformin could be actually a good way to I think based on protein synthesis, whatever, uh, a good way to, to actually intervene. And turns out it's right. AI is already generating scientific hypothesis. It's uh, generating scientific research. We had the you know, alpha fold with protein folding. It's amazing for the future of healthcare, for the future of education. You and I are investors in, in synthesis. They're working um, on an AI tutor. AI tutors solve the two sigma problem. The uh, two sigma pro Bloom's two sigma problem is that what he found is there's no education intervention in the world that could be as good as one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, and so the whole uh, idea behind the startup is to provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring for everyone in the world. And that really raises the global IQ. And so AI is the future of software, it's the future of humanity in my opinion. Now back to the EAC question, 
IAC takes it a little further, which is uh, the idea that we need to accelerate all sorts of human progress. And it's not just AI, it's also energy. What's happening in, uh, you know, with the degrowthers in Europe and the anti-nuclear people. Uh, and, and, and the idea behind IAC is how do you build a coalition of technologists and pro-humans, uh, pro-humanity ultimately, uh, folks that actually are countering the, the sort of degrowth uh, death cult that has plagued the, the West. Uh, and the idea behind it is the kind of Peter Thiel formulation is that some people kind of divide the world into developed versus developing. And the implicit assumption behind developed is we already were developed, we're done. It's time to cut the resources now. Uh, whereas the EAC idea is like, we're not developed at all. We're still primitive as to where we could go as a civilization. Which camp are you in? Uh, take a guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let, let's talk about training data real quick. Um, I recently saw that a bunch of uh, very well-known best-selling authors got together and they filed a class action lawsuit, I think against uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT. And they basically were like, hey, you took our work and used it as training data among other things, uh, and you should have paid us for it. Um, we've seen Elon Musk really kind of lock down Twitter. Uh, it seems like Twitter was a, a huge source of training data for these models. Um, where do you think it all shakes out? Like, will, will anything on the internet be fair game for the training models? Will people have to, if they want to train a model, go buy a bunch of data? How does this work out? Um, so he, here's where I'll show I'm not a, like a total like anarcho-capitalist, free radical. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think that uh, there's probably uh, um, some uh, there's, there's probably something a government here could could uh, could could actually provide clarity on. Uh, I think um, at least uh, the, the 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 problem, as, as it happened with crypto, is when there's so much regulatory uncertainty, the players in the market become kind of deranged. And so no one knows what to do. Uh, there's a bunch of lawsuits and maybe eventually we'll, we'll arrive at something. But having some clarity around um, what does it mean? And I think that there's like fair arguments on both sides. Those, those people affected by the training where the value of their labor is uh, cheapened um, because the output of their labor went into the input of, the, of training of this model. It's actually like a very... Like, like there's a moral argument there uh, that you, you've taken you've taken my labor. Uh, you obviously mixed it with your own labor, but but now you've reduced the need for my labor by by, by this new model that you created. Um, what we've done at Replit is uh, we tr we trained a large language model for code. Um, it's the smallest, most economical, fastest uh, model for code. It's a three billion parameter model. We trained it in April. What we did is we trained on open source data and uh, we released the model as open source because we thought that it's the ethical thing to do. If you train on public data, at minimum, what you should do is have your model be publicly accessible, mm -hmm. uh, publicly download, downloadable. And then we had, we wanted to keep some advantage for Replit. And so the data that Replit has and collects as part of our service, we trained a model that was 50% better uh, and that we kept for our users, our customers, right? And I think that's a fair trade. If you're OpenAI and you're training on all of the data of the internet, you should at least contribute something to the internet as, as part of the as open source. And maybe there's some advantage you keep for your company and this is the kind of the, the value you keep. The last thing I want to talk about is AI agents. Um, I think when people first kind of realized we're going to be able to do this, there was, an, it felt like every single day, multiple things were going viral on Twitter where it was just like, holy shit, look what this can do. What do you think is actually like commercial uh, available maybe five years from now versus hackers on the internet, you know, make it order them food or, or kind of do cool things, but there might not actually be like business opportunity there. I actually think agents are going to be huge. Um, but um, like uh, A, there's like a lot of infrastructure to build. We actually, three or four months ago, took a pause on a lot of the AI features we're building because we just realized that the amount of hacks that you have to do to get anything working was just like growing exponentially and the AI was getting worse over time. And so we took a step back and what we do at Replit is build abstractions. So we build an abstraction, we call it a chat service, not a very inspiring name, but basically 
uh, it figures out, it, it, it's like a multi-component system where there's like an intent detection layer without getting too much into the details, but I think a lot of people are just thinking about one model and maybe you recursively kind of prompt this model and this is an agent. But wh what I'm saying, agents are gonna be a society of models. There's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be different models at every part of the chain doing different things. And some of these models are gonna be hyper-specialized and trained to be more agentic. And maybe at the core, there's the mega models, the GPT-4, the Gemini's, GPT-5, whatever it's gonna be. But it's a system. And I think a lot of researchers, the way they think about AI is they think about just the model and the end-to-end -end learning of the model. As engineers, we need to think about systems. And to think about systems mean that you would need different tools for different part of components of this of the system. So I think agents are coming. Um, I would probably, I probably think by next year we're going to have pretty compelling uh, use cases, both in the consumer and enterprise side, and on the software creation side. Uh, but I would probably give it another uh, uh, year or two, probably 25, 26. Uh, a lot of our lives are going to be touched by AI agents, uh, such that you know everything will. You, whenever you're interacting with robots today, it kind of sucks. Like when, when you get when you're on the phone and kind of press one for customer service, whatever. This this sucks. It'll get a lot better. You'll be able to just talk to it. Um, a lot of the back office stuff is going to get automated, um, and uh, and it's, so I think I think everything in the economy will just like get behind the scenes better, but also a lot of consumer interactions will be a lot more delightful. It is funny that you call a phone tree and it, you know, asks you to talk now, or you just press zero a bunch of times and you feel like you hacked the matrix a little bit, yes. right? <laughs> and then they just like loop you back and you're like, fuck, all right, they're, they're smarter than me. Um, how can uh, how can businesses leverage Replit or, or like how can some of the founders who are here who um, either have businesses or think about starting businesses leverage the product? So I, I don't think we're ready to run entire businesses on Replit yet, but I, what I will say, if you're, if you're starting from scratch, I, I would just do it on Replit. Like if you're starting a product from scratch, you would move 10x faster by doing it on Replit. Uh, if you're a bigger company, do you want to start to adopt it? Think about a microservice or a back office task or internal tool or a Slack bot or whatever that could be an isolated thing that people can spin up really quickly. That, uh, uh, th that way you can s s sort of start adopting it. It can also be helpful for internal prototyping and sharing between between people inside the company. Um, but yeah, definitely, if you're starting, uh, if you're a fan of starting from scratch, like I used to, like for the first time, I'm like comfortable saying it would be a bad decision not to, not to do it on Replit. So uh, because recently we just um, released our deployments feature, and so you can actually deploy and scale up to infinity if you'd like uh, any kind of application. So I think it's. Uh, it's really wise to start there. Thank you so much for doing this. Of course, Everyone, my pleasure.